Oh, so, uh, I'm not going to bother saying anything because you all come to see this legend. So enjoy and have a good day, guys. exercise while I'm giving the speech. <laughs> but I think we, 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 we're going to let this slide one time, okay? We just hang out and do nothing. But anyway, uh, my first exposure actually to Australia was when I moved to America in 1968. I met a guy, an Australian guy by the name of Paul Grant. And uh, he was a power lifter. He uh, bench pressed 500 pounds, he squatted at 600 pounds. And he was unbelievably strong and he was also known to be an alligator wrestler. So I thought that every Australian is a powerlifting alligator wrestler. <laughs> Only to find out later on that in Australia has regular people, different kind of people, like everywhere else. But anyway, so that was my introduction. And I tell you that every time I come back to Australia, I've enjoyed coming back. As a matter of fact, I won my last Mr. Olympia competition in Sydney, Australia. It was in 1980 at the Sydney Opera House. It was really fantastic to get that same stage with a great <laughs> and uh, Frank Sinatra performed and where Queen Elizabeth watched the opera again uh, Pope John Paul held mass so it was really terrific for a bodybuilder to be at the same auditorium the same stage, the same opera house and, and to win the competition and of course I've always loved coming back and every time I come back I love this place more I remember at the beginning when I came back I loved the miles of beaches that you have here and then later on when I came to promote the movies I loved the fans because they always received me with open arms and my movies are always very successful here in Australia and then when I became governor I realized that uh, Australia is as keen and as interested in protecting the environment as California was and we worked together a lot during these times so it was really terrific to see a country that is so interested in creating a renewable energy future so I love that and today, of course, I love being here and traveling around the, the country to do speeches, motivational speeches. I never thought I'm going to do that. Uh, but it is fun to do that and to be here. And I want to say also thank you to Jamie McIntyre, who was one of the other promoters that brought me here and to, to, to do his, uh, his summits and his uh, financial summits. And they were all fun to do. But uh, the thing that I always do is before I hold a speech, I always do an informal poll to just find out a little bit of what the people want me to talk about. Because you never know. And it was really interesting that when I took a poll of this audience here, I mean, it was 40% of the people wanted me to talk about politics and policy. But 50% of the people wanted me to talk about bodybuilding and about show business. And, uh, The other 10% just wanted to have their money back from a movie, Hercules Goes Bananas. <laughs> 40 years ago, come on. But it is interesting that wherever I go today, and I think it has to do with the success that I've had in life, that wherever I go today, people always ask me, what is the secret to success? And I always tell them, I said, there's a short version, which is you have to have a 22-inch biceps. <laughs> You have to be able to kill predators with your bare hands. Right? And you have to be able to travel back in time and save the human race. Another one of those bus. And of course, you have to have this charming Austrian accent. So that, those are, those are the four things. But this is the short version. But since we, we have a little bit more time today, we can give you the longer version. And the reality is that I believe always in certain rules. And those rules are the ones that have made me successful. 
and I want to talk to you today about five rules that were absolutely essential. I believe that those rules can apply, of course, to almost anyone and everybody. You don't need to have to be a champion bodybuilder or to be an action hero or to be governor of the great state of California, not at all. I mean, if you want to excel in whatever you do, these rules are for you. Um, first, I want to just say that I always have been very intense. I always have been very hungry. I always wanted to be number one. I always wanted to be on the top. I always wanted to, to climb and to climb. I never had enough. Too much was never enough. Uh, I believe that I did not believe ever in just getting by. Uh, now, I have nothing against people that just want to get by because I think there's many roads to happiness. But I think that uh, you all seem to be very hungry to be successful. I think for you, those rules that I have will apply. The first and the most important rule that I want to talk to you about is, is uh, which I believe always very strongly, is having a vision. I believe that if you have a vision, it is so much easier to accomplish anything in life. If you don't have a vision, you just float around. There's really no purpose there. I mean, you can have the best ship in the world. You can have the best cruise liner in the world. But if the captain does not know where he's going, that ship is just going to float around in the ocean. It's never going to end up anywhere. And so this is why it is important that we have a direction that we know exactly where we're going. Or a good thing about it is, of course, uh, you know, when I grew up, was getting out of Austria. That's how I created my vision. Because I grew up after the Second World War, and in Austria there was depression, there was no food, there was hunger, starvation, then everyone was drunk all the time because they were losers, they lost the Second World War, thank God they did. Uh, but that did not create a good atmosphere to grow up in. And of course it was small and it was kind of restrictive and I just could not wait to escape from that place. I couldn't see myself to live in Austria and to live the regular life and to work in the factory, to work in the farm or even to follow my father's footsteps and to become a police officer. I couldn't see that either, even though that's what my parents wanted me to do. They wanted me to become a police officer like my dad and marry a girl by the name of Heidi and then uh, have a bunch of children and run around like the Von Trapp family in the sound of music. But that was my parents' plan. That was not mine. And one day I was very fortunate that in school I watched a documentary about America. And I found myself right away, I knew right away that I wanted to move to America. That's where I belong. I loved the documentary because America, it looked so huge. Everything was just gigantic, the skyscrapers, the bridges, the huge freeways with the beautiful cars on it, the jet liners, the movie stars, Muscle Beach, everything about America was just so fantastic. So from that point on, every time I saw a book about America, I read it right away, so I looked at the pictures. Every time I saw a newspaper article, I read it about America. Anytime there was a story in a magazine about America, I read it right away. The movies, American movies, I fell in love with and watched them over and over. The question was just, how do I get to America? So I saw, by coincidence, a magazine. A magazine that showed me the road, the path to America. It was a bodybuilding magazine. There was a magazine, on the cover was this huge muscular guy. It was Reg Park. Reg Park was on there in his Hercules pose, the Hercules outfit, and it said, Mr. Universe becomes Hercules star. And I bought the magazine right away, and this magazine I read as quickly as I could, and it was just fantastic. I mean, to read how this guy trained five hours a day, grew up in Leeds, in England, uh, also in the poverty, and then he won the Mr. Great Britain competition. And then he won the Mr. Universe competition. He kept training and training and training. And eventually, he won three Mr. Universe contests, and he ended up in Chinichita in Rome playing Hercules. And there he made millions of dollars. And with that money, he bought himself a gymnasium chain, and he became a very successful gym owner in South Africa. I read this and I became more and more certain about my own future. I felt like that Reg Park has laid out placing me a blueprint for my life. I wanted to become another Reg Park. I could see very clearly in my vision to stand on that stage like Reg Park in London to win the Mr. Universe competition and then to move to America and to get into movies and to become rich and famous.
That was my vision. I was so happy, I can tell you. I was so happy that I knew where I was going. All of a sudden, there was a purpose there. I knew what I should work for. From that moment on, everything that I did, no matter how hard I had to work, no matter how much I had to struggle, I just felt so happy. I felt so happy. It was a joy ride, the whole thing. Because ladies and gentlemen, I feel the simple truth is that if you don't have a vision, if you don't have a purpose or passion, or if you don't have your plan laid out in front of you, you just drift around with no purpose and there's nothing. And you will never end up anywhere. And this is why I always stress to people, I say, it's so important that you know exactly where you're going because then life becomes fun. And you can see when you look at the statistics all over the world, but one specifically in America, you can see the latest study shows that 74% of the people in America don't like their jobs. They don't like the job, they would like to switch it if they can. That means only a quarter of Americans are really happy with their life's work. And those kind of uh, numbers are very similar in Germany and in Austria and in other places too. People are not happy because they don't really know why they're going, where they're going, and why they're working, why they're struggling and all those things. Now this is why I think it is so important that we have a very clear vision. I always had a great time, no matter what I did. I always had the greatest time, even in my pumping iron days. In the gym, people ask me all the time, why are you smiling all the time? Why are you so happy? Well, besides that I had a great body, of course it was great. <laughs> I told them I smile because I know exactly where I'm going. To sit here with other people, maybe don't do it, they're going. I mean, look at the breast, they look at the sour, look at the face, and they're miserable that they have to work out all these hours a day. Because you train five hours a day, six hours a day. You lift 50 tons of weights, and you're happy. And I told him, I said, well, because I know that every rep that I do, every set that I do, every weight that I lift, is one step closer, takes me one step closer to achieve that goal and make my dream become a reality, which is to be on that stage and to win the trophy with the win Mr. Universe. So I couldn't really wait to do another thousand sit-ups. I couldn't wait to do another 500 pound squat. I couldn't wait to do more bench press or to do more curls and though I couldn't move my arms anymore. I couldn't wait for that moment because I knew that I'm getting closer and closer with each day of training become the Mr. Universe. And so this is such a great feeling when you have that. I mean, when I lifted, I didn't just feel like I had the dumbbells in the hand. I felt like I had the trophy in the hand to lift the trophy over my head every single time when I lifted. So that's what helped me so much. But it wasn't just in bodybuilding that the vision helped me so much. It was also in the movies. When I did action movies, the kind of kind of stunts that I had to do, over and over, they were dangerous stunts. I have heard many times, it was an agony, but I didn't care because I knew I always saw the finished movie, and I always saw the thousands and thousands of people around the world that really would get off on those movies and get entertained by those movies. So this is why I didn't really care. I remember there was one uh, a particular uh, movie, there was uh, Conan the Barbarian. There was a scene in Conan the Barbarian where I had to crawl on all four with the sword in front of me. Holding the sword in front of me like this and to crawl on all four over rocks and gravel. And I did ten takes. And after ten takes, my knees started bleeding and my elbows started bleeding. And it started really hurting. And the director came to me sheepishly and he said to me, he says, I don't feel mind if you want to take. I need a close-up. As you crawl, there's 30 feet. I need a great close-up of your face. And I said, no, I don't care. He says, well, you know, I don't want to abuse the relationship here. He said, because I can see you're bleeding already and you're hurting. And I said, I said, don't worry about that. He said, what do you mean don't worry about it? I said, because I don't care about the bleeding and about the pain because I see the finished scene. I see myself in a movie already, you know, sneaking up behind Tulsa Doom, the main villain in the movie, Conan the Barbarian, that killed my parents, that killed Conan's parents. 
I was sneaking up behind him with my sword and then rising up behind him and cutting his head off. <laughs> and getting finally revenge for killing my parents. I say, I see that scene and I think the people are going to scream and they see that scene. So we have to do this scene perfectly. And so therefore, if I think I have to do, go up and down here and do the same scene 50 more times, it doesn't matter to me because pain is temporary, but the movie is going to be permanent. So see, again, it helped me with my vision. The over and over, to me, to see the finished product is always what motivated me. This is why the rule number one is discover your vision and the rest will follow. <laughs> now, that leads me to my second rule. Never ever think small. If you're going to accomplish anything in life, you have to think big and you have to shoot for the stars. The biggest challenge that people have is that they think small. And the reason why I think people think small is because they really are afraid to shoot for a big goal because they feel like if they shoot for a big goal, then the failure, the chance of failure is very high, which is true. But so what? Why be afraid of failure? A failure only a failure if you fall and you don't get up. But if you get up, you know the failure. I mean, everyone, it doesn't matter if it's a sport or if it's a child or if it's a relationship, whatever you do, you're going to fail eventually. There's no such thing as going through life without failure. So you might as well just take that. And how far can you fall? Only to the ground. I don't care about failing. I always get up. You know the word, I'll be back. <laughs> That's exactly what I say to myself if I fail, if I fall. So this is why it is so important if we have to go and shoot for big goals. In German, of course, there's a saying, Benchon, Benchon, which means that if you do something, then go all out and do it well. So this is exactly what I did with everything. I remember in bodybuilding, I didn't just want to be a bodybuilding champion. I wanted to be the best bodybuilder of all times. I wanted to have the biggest muscles of all times. I wanted to have the most definition. I wanted to win the most trophies, the most world championship titles. I wasn't happy with anything less than that. In the same as in movies. I didn't just want to be in movies. I wanted to be a movie star. I wanted to be a leading man. I wanted to have a multiple title credit. I wanted to be the highest paid actor. I wanted basically to be another John Wayne or Pete Eastwood or something like that, right? <laughs> Why not? I said to myself, the same as in politics. When I, read, when I jumped into politics, I couldn't see myself running for a city council. <laughs> or to be Mayor Schwarzenegger? No, no. He had to be Governor Schwarzenegger. And it wasn't just any governor, but it was governor of the greatest state in the United States, California. See, I always was shooting for the top. That's what I was interested in. Let me give you an example of thinking big. When I became governor, I wanted to redo the infrastructure in California. Because America has been living off infrastructure that was built in the 50s and 60s. And I thought it was about time to be upgrade. I mean, we haven't invested in our new roads, or in schools, or in universities the way we ought to. But in the meantime, the amount of cars have quadrupled since the 60s. So therefore, we need four times as many freeways, we need four times as, uh, as many bridges, and tunnels, and on ramps and off ramps, but we don't have that. So I thought it was time to upgrade. I mean, I mean, we talk about infrastructure. I wanted to not just to fix roads. I wanted to build giant, massive freeways on top of our existing freeways. I wanted to build the first high-speed rail. I wanted to build bridges and tunnels and all kinds of things. I mean, the things that we need in order to really move forward so people don't get stuck in traffic because it's inexcusable that Californians get stuck in traffic or that they have to send their kids to overcrowded and schools, and that our universities are bursting at the seams, and that we have a sewage system in Los Angeles that is a hundred years old. I mean, that's shitty. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I want to mention first the legislators looked at me like I was absolutely insane. They said, hey, what are you talking about when you want to rebuild the whole California? I mean, they wanted to spend maybe five billion dollars on infrastructure, but there was petty cash for me. I want to do much better than that. You see, some politicians, they cannot think really big because they've never even been outside California. So they don't know what kind of huge infrastructure is all over America or in Asia, for instance, in China, in South Korea, or in Brazil, or in the European countries, or here in Australia. They haven't seen any of those. And of course, other politicians simply don't have the vision 
of the future, past, and next election, which is a common problem with politicians all over the world. So it was my job as governor to motivate them and to get them excited to show them in Los Angeles the bump of the bump of traffic in the overcrowded schools. And then eventually they started buying in and seeing my vision. And I kept pushing and pushing. And eventually Democrats and Republicans came together and we invested $60 billion to rebuild California's infrastructure. And now you see cranes everywhere. Now we're building these roads and the schools and university buildings and affordable housing and all the things. And it's the biggest investment in our state in 50 years because we all thought big. This is why it is so important to thank people because this way we got the, the, the people's work done and the state benefited from that because of big banking. And this is why I said to you, remember that. Don't thank small, thank big. That brings me to my third rule. Ignore the naysayers. I mean, you know that every time you have a big vision and a big plan and a big goal, that people are going to say to you, it won't happen. I, it's impossible. It, 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 no. So I say to you, eliminate those words from your vocabulary. Eliminate that I can, no, and impossible. In each of my careers, when someone said impossible, I said, I hear possible. When they said I can't, I heard I can. And when they said no, I heard very loud and clear, yes. So there was simple as that. I remember very clearly that I always was a big believer in what Nelson Mandela said, because he said that it's always impossible until someone does it. That's exactly the truth. When someone does it, then all of a sudden it's impossible. If it's breaking a record in the sport, or doing something unusual in business and so on. So just think about it. As many times I would have really discontinued my career if I would have listened to the naysayers. I mean, my career would have been over a long time ago. Right away when I was 15 years old, I said that I wanted to be a bodybuilding champion. And in Austria, everyone said, that's impossible. That's not an Austrian sport. If you want to be a champion in Austria, you have to be a ski racer or a bicycle rider or track and field after or something like that. But bodybuilding is an American sport. Forget it. You would never be a bodybuilding champion. Then when I wanted to go to America, they said, it's impossible. You have no money. You're all by yourself. Yeah, you're sure. It's a crazy trip. Forget about it. And then when I got into show business, it was the same thing again. After I won 13 World Bodybuilding Championships, I went, I wanted to go and do what Rich Park did, which is to go and become a movie star. So I, I, I met with agents and with studio executives and with managers. And guess what they said? They said, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> and that's a good one, Arnold. You want to be a leading man? Are you out of your mind? I mean, look at the body you have. <laughs> look at all these muscles. You look like a, a monster. It doesn't fit into any movie today. Stars and little, Dustin Hoffman. That's a new star. Al Pacino, Woody Allen. Those are the new sex symbols. <laughs> <laughs> I said to myself, I cannot believe that. I said, I want to do Hercules movies. He said, No, no, forget it. It wouldn't happen. He said, You're 20 years late for that. 20 years ago, you did Hercules movies. And plus, your accent. It gives us it kind of it gives me a little bit the creeps. <laughs> <laughs> it gives me the, the, the goosebumps, the chills, you know, when they got this kind of German dialogue and all this. And by the way, have you ever seen an international star that has a German accent? He says, Arnold, come and get real. It's not gonna happen. And plus your name, what is it? Schwartz Schnitzel or something like that? <laughs> I can see that already up there on the billboard. The people are gonna storm the theater. Uh, because they're going to be so excited to listen to Schwartz and Schnitzel or the theme. <laughs> Look, you're a nice guy. Why don't we just forget about all of this? Why don't we get the gym business? Get into the gym business or open up a health food store and get some little parts. You can get the little parts. No problem with that. You can play maybe uh, a bouncer with his body of yours. Perfect. Or a wrestler or something like that. Or uh, no, even better, a Nazi officer. <laughs> People at Hogan's Heroes, and then we can get a great job or something like that. So this is what they said to me. And you know something? I didn't listen. Luckily, I did not listen. Because I knew that if I would work hard, 
And you might work as hard as I did to buy them, five, six hours a day on my active, that I wouldn't be able to go and prove them wrong, that I would make it. And so I started taking acting classes and English classes, speech classes, dialogue classes, even accent removal classes. <laughs> I ran around all day buying wine, rose and a vine. <laughs> because the Germans are difficult in the Austrian with the F and the W and the V, you get all confused with those things. So I did the practice of buying the wine, the rose and the vine. Right? And the F and the W and the V. And then the zinc is made out of zinc. Yeah, it's very important to pronounce all the things the right way. You know something? All this practicing in these acting classes and speech classes and do doing all those things paid off because eventually I started getting little parts on, on television and eventually, eventually bigger parts. And then I remember Lucio Ball calling me in the gym and said, I'll come in for a reading. I want to have you in my television show, a two hour television show, Happy Anniversary and Goodbye. I did a six minute scene with her with Art Carney which was fantastic, we played an Italian masseur. I mean, I had a German accent. <laughs> so, no one knows the difference between those two accents. But I got the great job from then. I got the, the guest starring role in the streets of San Francisco with Michael Douglas and uh, with Carl Mall. And then from then on, it started happening. Pumping Iron, we started uh, filming Pumping Iron. We did Stay Hungry. And then I landed a big role in Conan the Barbarian. And the rest is history. You know something? That as soon as we finished Conan the Barbarian and we won a promotion tour for the movie, the director said to the press, if we wouldn't have had Schwarzenegger with his big muscles, we would have had to build one. <laughs> so all of a sudden, this big obstacle of this body was a big asset. You see what I'm saying? And then when the determinator, James Cameron, said that, you know, we were very lucky with Schwarzenegger because the I'll Be Back line became the most famous line in movie history because his crazy accent, he said. <laughs> because he sounded like a machine. That's what made the Terminator believable because Schwarzenegger sounded like a machine. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So all of those things uh, that the naysayers said would be my liability became the asset. See, I did not listen to them to the next second. And the same thing, of course, was also in politics. As soon as I jumped into the race uh, and ran for governor, they said, you're absolutely crazy. When that happened, happen, you're going to lose. It will be highly embarrassing. And the rest, of course, is history. Two months later, I was governor of the state of California. <laughs> <laughs> so the point that I made is, is if I would have listened to the naysayers, my career would have ended when I was 50 years old. I would still be up there in the Austrian Alps yodeling. <laughs> I would not be talking to you today. I'm talking to you today simply because I did not listen to it can't be done, or no, or it's impossible. So ignore the naysayers. The fourth rule is work your ass off. Nobody ever stumbled up on success by accident, except maybe if you're the guy that found gold in California. They did. But don't ever think that you can be that guy. I mean, you never want to fail because you didn't work hard enough. I always believed in no stone unturned. Muhammad Ali, one of my great heroes, who had a wonderful line in the 70s, and he was asked, how many sit-ups do you do? He said, I don't know, because I never start counting until it starts burning. Now think about that. He started counting his sitters when it started burning. Now that's what is the difference here. That's what makes a champion. And it doesn't matter in what area you're in, if you're in sports or business or anything else. No pain, no gain. The bottom line is, no one of my rules will work unless you work your butt off. It drives me absolutely nuts when people say, I don't have time to work out. I'm working so hard, I'm tired, I cannot work out. Now what a stupid thing to say. <laughs> I've never seen them all, they don't have time to read a book. Or they don't have time and they're tired, they cannot improve themselves in any way, physically or mentally. Or they cannot improve their business. They cannot read anything or learn anything. Because they're tired and they're working so hard. In the meantime, the day is 24 hours. We sleep six hours, so we have 18 hours left. Now I know you're thinking, no, no, wait a minute, I sleep eight hours, right? <laughs> we just sleep faster, okay? <laughs> <laughs> a little faster. The bottom line is, 
When I came to America, I worked. I worked on five hours a day, ended in construction business. I was a bricklayer and worked on that all day. Then I went to college and do business classes, ended in acting classes from 8 o'clock at night to 12 midnight every day. That's what I did because I knew that the day is 24 hours and I did not want to waste one single hour. I believe of what Ted Turner said. Ted Turner is one of the great entrepreneurs that started CNN. He said, early to pay, early to rise, work like hell, and advertise. That's exactly the rule. Just remember that you can't climb the ladder of success with your hands in your pockets. So you must work your ass off. And now is the fifth and the final rule. Don't just pay. Give something back. Very important. Leave your mark in the world. I believe that we all have an obligation to do something for our community, something for our state, something for our country. I mean, we must serve a cause that is greater than ourselves. Because we all know that at the end we will be judged not by how much we make, but by how much we give. And so, ever since I went to America and I was received with old moms, I felt obligated. I felt this urge and this responsibility to give something back in America. Because I know that everything that I have accomplished in life is because of America. If it's my bodybuilding career, my show business career, my political career, my wonderful family that I have, the money that I have made, everything is because of America. But I also have to recognize that America did not become the land of opportunity, the greatest country in the world, by itself. That people in the history of America worked tirelessly. They worked very hard. People fought. People died to make this the land of freedom, the land of opportunity, and of liberty. And so now it is our time to do something about it and to give something back. And it has nothing to do with just America, no matter in what country you live. If you live in Australia, or in Japan, or in China, or in, 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 in Austria, or in Italy, you've got to give something back to your country. You've got to give something back because there's so many people that need your help. As a matter of fact, Sergeant Schreiber, my father-in-law, that started the Peace Corps, Job Corps, Legal Aid to the Poor, under the Kennedy administration and Chancellor administration in the 60s. He was the greatest public servant that I've ever met. And he was a big believer, and he always said that he said the number one privilege and the most honorable profession to be a public servant. He gave a speech at the university at Yale, a commencement speech, and he told the students, tear down that mirror. Tear down that mirror that makes you always look at yourself. And you will be able to look beyond that mirror and you will see the millions of people that need your help. And I always saw those millions of people. This is why I took every opportunity that I could to give something back. I became the international coach, weightlifting coach for Special Olympics. I started the, as the chairman of the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports out of the Bush administration from 1990 to 1993 to travel to all 50 states in the United States to promote health and fitness for our youngsters. I started after-school programs for our most uh, 